Okay, well, welcome back, everyone. I uh, hope you had a good morning. Um, as someone from London, I'm glad I learned something. As a Londoner, there are no hippos in Glenrothes, so that's good. <laughs> Don't go away t totally ignorant. So we're in the midst of day of divers, snorkelers, birders, bug hunters, and a menagerie of data scientists, zoologists, biologists, ecologists. We're, ha we're ranging through the centuries and through the technologies. Uh, and above all, we're hearing about key topics in the world of biodiversity data collection and use. And that brings us on to the Sir John Burnett Memorial Lecture 2023, when we'll be hearing from Natalie Prosser, who was appointed in April 2022 as CEO of the Office of Environmental Protection, the OEP, the new environmental watchdog that was created under the Environment Act 2021. Natalie, a solicitor by training, with 15 years in government and experience at several regulators, and is steeped in public and regulatory law. I read the OEP is tasked with protecting and improving the environment and holding government and public bodies to account. A small task, I'm sure, and I look forward to hearing exactly how that's going on. So, Natalie, over to you. Thank you, everyone. Now, my team told me when I was preparing for this that everyone will just have had lunch and therefore you will be snoozing. I was advised to make my talk animated and lively and, if possible, to uh, include some audience participation. Don't get your hopes up. Um, I'll try my best. So I'd like to say an enormous thank you uh, for inviting me here today uh, to give the Sir John Burnett Lecture at such a prestigious uh, event. Uh, my name's Natalie, I'm the CEO of the Office for Environmental Protection for England and Northern Ireland. Uh, my talk today will be quite England focused with a, a sprinkling of Northern Ireland because that's the nature of our remit, but I, I appreciate the issues that we raise do uh, affect all four uh, countries of the United Kingdom. So on to the audience participation, go on. How many of you here have heard of the OEP? And stick your hands up. Wow. That's one of the best responses I've ever had. I have been in a room with planners and I got about five hands up. That was a, that was a tough gig. Um, put your hands back up if you think if you got in a lift, you'd be able to tell somebody what we actually do. Yeah, that's more like it. Yeah. <laughs> It's not, an easy, uh, it's not an easy elevator pitch. I've been working on it for about two years. It's not going to be an elevator pitch today, so buckle in. Um, so I'm going to tell you a bit more about the OEP uh, in a little bit. Before I get to that, uh, I'll start with full disclosure. I'm definitely not a scientist. Uh, and I have no long career as an environmentalist uh, either. I'm going to fess up. I'm a lawyer. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> by training. Uh, I'm a regulator though by uh, trade, but I recognise that both of these professions uh, might be said to carry a little bit of reputational baggage. Don't apologise. Uh, and my background probably puts me rather in the minority uh, here today. So why have they put a regulator and a lawyer in charge of the Office for Environmental Protection? Well, let me talk to you a little bit about regulation. Um, it's really important, I think, to understand if you're a regulatory theorist like I am. I'm, I'm great fun at parties, don't get me wrong. Um, <laughs> the purpose of regulation is to manage down the risk of harm. Think of it as a harm reduction business. That's harms to people, harms to communities, and in our case, harms to the environment uh, itself. And as a society, we choose to regulate when forces exist that left to themselves will cause harms that we have decided as a society are not acceptable to us. And it is abundantly clear that many forces exist that will cause harm to our environment. They have caused harm and they will continue to do so unless they are constrained. And regulation, like it or not, is a primary way in which the forces that can cause harm are constrained. So we are, we are stuck with it, ladies and gentlemen, and that's great because it pays my bills. How well we regulate, though, really matters because effective regulation, really good regulation, and that doesn't mean lots of it. Lots of people think good regulation is lots of it. That's not true at all. But really good regulation means less harm, less damage, less loss, less risk. 
Poor regulation, on the other side, is a burden on society, but more importantly, allows those unacceptable harms that we as a society have decided we will not tolerate, it lets them occur. And we have seen that happen. Now, we don't claim to be a regulator at the OEP. Our chair is very firm on this. I quite like to think we're a bit of a regulator, but that's just so I can go to all the regulatory conferences and hang out with geeks like myself. Um, but we are in the business of managing uh, down harm. And our job is to oversee the environmental regulators and delivery bodies. Uh, the regulator of the regulators has been used by other people, not by me, because I'm not allowed to. Um, and if I break it down how we do that, so our job is to scrutinise how well our environmental laws are working in practice. There's a mixed scorecard on that at the moment. Uh, draw on the experience that we have looking at laws uh, so that when new environmental laws come through, they're designed uh, really well and implemented really well. Both of those things are important. And fundamentally, our job is to hold government to account for delivering on its own promises. And we do that partly by independently assessing progress every single year, making clear what is working well, making clear what is not, and giving advice on how things can improve. And it is a challenging role. But I suggest to all of you today that it is a crucial one. We say what needs to be said without fear or favour, and we operate independently of the public bodies we oversee. So therefore, you can see how you use the, two, the tools of my trade as a lawyer and a regulator, as the CEO uh, of the Office for Environmental Protection, using environmental laws and targets, enforcement activity, monitoring reports and scrutiny. And these have a critical role in making our regulatory system work for our environment. And right now, we are keenly focused on playing our full part in tackling the acute by a diversity crisis that now faces us. Now, there's always a risk that our work can sound a little dry. I'll do my best uh, to, to make it interesting for all of you, but there is always a risk around that. Uh, and I've already said that I might find the subject of a regulation really exciting, but I am odd, so that's uh, understandable. But it's worth reminding ourselves of the reality of the situation that we now face. And I, I know you'll all be well versed in this. I might be preaching to the choir a little bit. The sobering studies of the intactness of our native biodiversity. And we must keep all of this in focus. We are one of the most nature depleted countries in the world. And this is an awful thing to have to say. And not only that, key biodiversity trends, many of which are based on the data collected by this diligent audience, show a general picture of further decline. Overall, things are getting worse and not better. So, for example, the UK Wild Birds Indicator published recently by the British Trust for Ornithology and others shows that the abundance of wild breeding birds on the whole is in continued decline. And although we can see some stabilisation in the abundance of some ecological groupings, such as upland and wetland birds, this picture is not at all uh, encouraging. And a similar picture exists across the UK's four nations for many key indicators. Now, in England, our current scrutiny of government progress against its environmental improvement plan, until recently that was the 25-year environmental plan, if you don't live and breathe governance like I do, our analysis shows that the abundance of priority species has been in, long -term, in a long-term state of decline. And there have been a few positive signs of recovery over the last five years. However, when you consider natural vari variability and uncertainty in the indicators themselves, we currently do not yet see the hopeful bending of the curve that will first halt and then reverse the decline in species and achieve the key newly set legally binding targets that the government has set for itself. So we conclude that nature is in crisis and the lack of improvement cannot be a surprise to you in this room. And where I know that great efforts are underway to try and turn this around, as a society, we simply must do more. We must be more effective and we must have more impact. That's why me and my colleagues at the OEP are passionate about our mission to protect and improve the environment but we have to do that as part of our role by holding government and other public bodies to account. 
So there's my, uh, my opening gambit. So I'm going to turn a little bit to the nuts and bolts of what the OEP is and how we operate. You can take notes, so if you are stuck in a lift with an interesting person who wants to know who we are, you will have the answers. The OEP was established by the Environment Act 2021. It was the act that gave us the mission to hold government and other public authorities to account to their environmental laws and their targets. And to give a bit of context, uh, we turned two last week uh, in legal terms. Uh, that doesn't mean we're up and running. We've been operational for 16 months now, so we are still, I kill, call us the new kid on the block, I still think that holds. Our remit covers uh, England uh, and Northern Ireland, but we have uh, fantastic working relationships with our colleagues uh, in Wales uh, and here in Scotland with Environmental Standards Scotland. And we were brought about as part of a new approach to environmental governance, which was triggered by uh, EU exit. I get compared unfavourably with the Commission on a regular basis, particularly on Twitter. I try not to take it personally. They have a bigger stick uh, than I ever have, but currently we run four times faster than they do. So, you know, swings and roundabouts. Uh, the other parts of the Act that are relevant from an environmental governance uh, perspective are our new legally binding uh, statutory targets set earlier this year. Uh, making the Environmental Improvement Plan, what was the 25-year Environment Plan, and what is now uh, EIP 23, uh, a legally binding obligation uh, on government, uh, and also establishing the Environmental Principles Policy Statement, it trips off the tongue, uh, which now makes it mandatory in force from the start of this month for government departments to have regard to those well-established uh, environmental principles. And we have four functions in regulatory terms. These are the things that we can do to do our job. Uh, we scrutinise those environmental improvement plans. That's in England and in Northern Ireland, although Northern Ireland is late in setting theirs for complicated reasons. Uh, we scrutinise the targets as well. Uh, we scrutinise uh, environmental law, both the making of it and the using of it. Uh, we can provide advice to government, uh, specifically on environmental law, where we can advise them whether we are asked to uh, give that advice or not, uh, and more broadly. Uh, and we have investigation and enforcement powers, which is the thing that everybody is most interested in, gets us on the news, um, but is really only part of the toolkit. You can't litigate your way out of a nature crisis. And we use those four things, those four things that we can do in pursuit of four main uh, goals. The first one, no surprises, sustained environmental improvement is pretty fundamental to who we are. We also want to see better environmental law and we want to see it better implemented. There's lots of betters in there, but then we have got a way to go. And we want to see more compliance with the law that exists, particularly when it's good law. Uh, and we want to be a really good organisation. We're only little. There's 75 of us, about a quarter of our staff are based in Northern Ireland. So that's not a very large number of people uh, to take on uh, the entirety of, uh, of the environmental uh, system, apart from some parts of climate change. Thankfully, I haven't got to deal with that uh, just yet, because that's, uh, I think that would break us. Um, but it's a big remit. Uh, and I'm going to talk through those four goals uh, to talk you through a little bit about some of the actual work uh, that we're doing, uh, and also why data is critically important uh, in so many of those areas. So I mentioned that one of our functions is to scrutinise progress against government's uh, environmental improvement plan and their targets. Uh, we had the new one uh, in January in this year. Northern Ireland, I said, we're still uh, waiting for one. It is overdue, uh, overdue uh, in law. And this is a really important bit of kit uh, in terms of environmental uh, governance. It sets out, or it's meant to set out, a comprehensive plan for the environment that government, not just the Department of the Environment, is committed to. It's meant to be a cross-government coordinating uh, uh, document that integrates uh, and brings together uh, environmental protection, <laughs> the degree to which it does that. Um, remains to be seen, but that's certainly uh, the intent. Um, in January this year, as part of the first cycle of our scrutiny of that, we published our first meaningful, substantive, independent report uh, on government's progress. Uh, it, it's some dismal reading. You can find it on our website. 
uh, we found, and I'll choose my words carefully, that the government was not demonstrably on track to achieve any of the goals in the 25-year environment plan, not a single one. Uh, and I choose my words carefully about not demonstrably on track because for a number of those goals, there simply wasn't the information available to make the assessment. One of the key findings in our report was that simply uh, won't do. That assessment showed that the current pace and scale of action will not deliver the changes necessary to significantly improve the environment uh, in England. But, and it's important, there is opportunity to change course. It is not too late. The ambitions can be achieved, uh, but change and improvement needs to happen. So one of those opportunities, for example, exists in nature-friendly farming, one of the largest pressures uh, on the environment is the agriculture sector. But if we get it right, if government policy properly supports that, it can also be the largest uh, enabler for improvement on land and uh, also in water. And it's not easy. We know that, otherwise it would have been done already. But we can do better. And we think it is possible to bend that curve of biodiversity loss. Uh, we're not giving up. It can be done. To rise to the challenge of delivering all of the ambitions described in the IP, we called for better alignment and coordination at all levels of government, including local and national. We're not, we don't see that. Uh, with actions that extend beyond DEFRA, we pointed out the need for better targeted uh, and timely data collection and collation with the goals of the EIP in mind, using the data to line up with the, with the goals and with the targets, so you know where you're starting, you know where you're going, you know where you're trying to get to. That's not there at the moment. Uh, improved assessments of progress, for which you need that data, and purpose-driven monitoring, evaluation, and learning programs, so you know what's working, and when things are not working, you can change course. In short, all of that comes down to better planning for effective delivery. And here we come across a key theme of this conference. We go back to data. The UK does have some of the best environmental data sets in the world when it comes to assessing environmental improvement. But we still find their analysis and presentation lacking in a number of ways. In England and Northern Ireland, for example, there are major data gaps to monitor the health of soils and the marine environment. And there are also, and there are no surprises to you here, data access issues. Now, for example, we are pleased that DEFRA recently published an update to the abundance of priority species in England. I mentioned that before. This has been five years in waiting, and that is just too long. Until a few days ago, the most recent data on the decline of priority species stopped in 2018. Despite uh, your survey work uh, and initial analysis that underpin those data have been completed uh, years earlier. And this is a big constraint on delivery groups in using the most up-to-date information to make timely changes to their plans. We have our next report uh, imminent. Uh, we are well advanced with it. It is going to be published uh, in January uh, next year. And while we will assess progress against the individual EIP goals, as we are obliged to do, biodiversity is very much front and centre in our thinking. We are conducting an in-depth assessment on the theme of improving nature. No spoilers. Please have a look out for our report uh, coming out uh, in January. The reason we've had that focus is that the EIP uh, 2023, the replacement to the 25-year environment plan, uh, has an apex target of thriving plants and wildlife. And we've looked uh, at analysis of species abundance, nature recovery targets, as well as the plans in place uh, to deliver them. We are trying to work out where the barriers are to progress. We're trying to see where the opportunities are uh, to do better. And to support that, we undertook a public call for evidence uh, over the summer, uh, to which we had a very, very helpful uh, response. And thank you to anyone in this audience who contributed to that call uh, for evidence. Our work is always so much better informed uh, when we can draw on the insights of our many well-informed uh, stakeholders. And as well as the individual goal areas, EIP 23 identifies cross-cutting themes such as green finance, green choices, natural capital, new farming schemes, and biodiversity uh, net gain. We've also identified the attributes that a good EIP uh, should have. We want to see a clear vision. Uh, we think that helps unify thinking. 
Uh, we want to see that translated effectively into policy and commitments and actions across government, uh, not just in uh, uh, DEFRA. And delivery plans are absolutely key. Uh, and our view is that those delivery plans have to be more than a list of actions, a list of things uh, that must be done. We need to know how they're going to contribute. Uh, and essentially, the way we think about it is we want to see how they stack up. So when you put intervention on top of intervention on top of intervention, is it going to get you to that target? Uh, and at the moment, we can't see the evidence uh, that they do. We also want to see those plans being far more transparent to allow everyone to see and understand what needs to be done. And we also think there is a critical gap here. We will continue to press the government for increased transparency over its plans. It is not an issue we are going to let go, uh, and we know we are not the only voice uh, doing so. But back to the point about data, it's, it's just it's so important, and concerns about gaps and opportunities are a regular theme across all of our work. So that's, uh, that's the start. Let me talk a bit more about better laws uh, and better implemented laws. Well-designed laws that are well-implemented are key to environmental protection and improvement. We see them as foundational uh, on which other efforts and activities uh, stand. Uh, and that includes tackling biodiversity loss, protecting habitats such as from pressures such as uh, developments uh, and other areas of environmental uh, regulation. And we do get it that the government has competing priorities for example, around new homes. Uh, and politically, these pressures are sometimes placed as in conflict with one another, but we don't see it that way. Our view is that good regulation can achieve a good balance between these priorities, as long as they are sound and well implemented. With that in mind, we've very recently looked in detail at the implementation of the environmental assessments regimes, particularly relating to new developments. We just published a report on that. Uh, and doing that, we looked at uh, habitats regulations assessments, strategic environmental assessments and environmental impact assessments. We wanted to get a sense of what worked and what didn't. And that's in the context of a new Leveling Up and Regeneration Act, which has the potential to create a new regime around environmental assessments. And it's no surprise that we found the main barriers uh, to these regimes uh, not being effective wasn't really to do with the laws uh, themselves uh, at all. Uh, you change the law, but you don't change the practice, you're not going to solve the problem. This is a consistent theme, again, that we see in environmental regulation. Uh, what we found uh, in our research was that uh, the point about data came up uh, over and over again, uh, with concerns about lack of ready access to relevant data being a significant barrier to an effective system. Uh, and the work that you do uh, at MBN to improve and facilitate access uh, to data is vital in this area. And you will appreciate uh, more than most uh, the importance of continuing to improve in this area. We also found issues here about uh, inadequacies in post-decision monitoring. What that means basically is not following up uh, on decisions to make sure actions have been taken. Uh, and uh, simply a lack of expertise uh, and resource in planning authorities. And you can see what I mean there about why the laws can change, but you won't achieve uh, the objectives that you're looking for unless you really tackle the ways of working and how those laws are being used in practice. It's all about implementation and action. And that's when I talk about regulation, that's what I mean. I don't mean rules, I mean the practice on the ground of how you use them to achieve the objectives. And, and we think, and the evidence supports us, that so much hinges uh, in that area. So, looking ahead, uh, we have some other programmes of work in train. Uh, we're doing a, a very substantive piece of work uh, on the laws around protected sites, um, looking at special areas of conservation uh, and special protected areas in both England uh, and Northern Ireland. Uh, and we're also doing a, a substantial piece of work looking at uh, the Water Framework Directive as it's being used in practice. And again, that's in uh, anticipation of likely reform uh, in this area. Uh, I could talk to you about some of our other work. You can find everything that we're doing uh, on our website. We have particular interest in the implementation um, of the biodiversity net gain uh, and the marine net gain proposals. Again, we have said so much turns on how these regimes are implemented. Uh, huge opportunity. 
uh, it could easily uh, be wholly ineffective. And it's not the laws that matter here, it's how they are used. Uh, finally, I'll talk very, very briefly about some of our compliance uh, with environmental law work. This is the stuff uh, that gets us on the telly. Um, although it is only a proportion uh, of our work. We have two very significant investigations ongoing at the moment, one into the regulation uh, of combined sewage overflows uh, in England, where we're investigating uh, the DEFRA Secretary of State, Environment Agency uh, and Ofwat, and we are at a very critical stage of that investigation, and as much as I would like to talk about it more, I've been told in no uncertain terms absolutely not to. Um, we have another major investigation going on in Northern Ireland uh, in relation to uh, permitting of certain agricultural buildings uh, because of the very, very significant amount of ammonia pollution uh, that is present in Northern Ireland. I've had the same briefing. I can't talk about it. Don't talk about it. Um, what I can say is that there will be key decisions on both of these cases very, very imminently. And when we get to that decision point, we will be in line with the, uh, the way that we work, completely transparent about it. So I imagine, we, I imagine you'll hear about that on the news um, because that's usually how these things uh, go. So if I may sum up about why environmental governance matters, we're not a boots on the ground regulator. We're not out there in the field like so many uh, of you are. We work in the background but our job is to make the whole system work more effectively. We're there to shine a light where things are not working. And ultimately, in those most serious of situations where the law is simply not being followed, we're empowered to take very firm uh, investigation and follow-up enforcement action. We have already shown that we are very willing to do that. We have shown that we are willing to say what needs to be said, however uncomfortable that is for government. But rarely can I make government do something the government doesn't want to do. A lot of what we have to do is bring, uh, bring it to light to allow proper public scrutiny, to allow parliamentary scrutiny, uh, and make sure there is an independent, trustworthy assessment of how things are, where we're going, and what we could do better. That's the job that, they ha that we have at the OEP. I have a team of fantastic people who are com completely committed uh, to that objective. Um, I hope... Uh, that I've given you a bit of a flavour uh, of what, uh, what we're doing. Uh, and please do stand behind us uh, as we try, as I say to my people, to change the world. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We'll take a couple of questions, squeeze in a couple of questions. Any questions? No, we can't. There was a lot of parliamentary debate about that. If we took money off government, we'd just give it back to another bit of government and it would all be a bit of a waste of time. Um, we... Uh, we can investigate, so what that means is we'll do a very detailed piece of work and assess and make a determination about whether we think that public authority has broken the law. We've already found, um, even in the preliminary stages of the cases we're working on, uh, that public bodies take that incredibly seriously, that the public takes it incredibly seriously. Um, our uh, institutions of government are meant to comply with the law, and when they don't, or when there's an implication that they're, that they're not, that has consequences, and quite significant ones. Um, Ultimately, we can't enforce that, but what we can do and what we're empowered to do is take those matters to court. Uh, so if a public authority rejects uh, the position as we set it out, and of course these things are always extremely complicated behind the scenes, um, if we think they're wrong, we can take them to court, and we absolutely will take them to court if that's the right thing to do. And then it's in the hands of the courts. What the courts can do is make orders to put things right. It's not a straightforward system. It is imperfect in many, many ways. And we'd always try and negotiate our way to a, a good outcome uh, as much as possible. But this is completely unprecedented in the domestic uh, system uh, in England. It's unprecedented in Northern Ireland. As far as I can tell, it's pretty much unprecedented in the world. So it's an interesting experiment. But as I said, I've got two cases, very significant cases in the pipeline um, right now. We will be making decisions on whether they progress to more formal action um, within the next couple of months. So we shall see. Thank you very much. Mm. Pardon? That's absolutely right. fine. So another round of applause, please. For All this. <laughs>
I've got time. I've got time. Oh, yeah. You did this last time. <laughs> One more question, then, apparently. Oh, I was just going to ask, uh, what's the relationship, if any, so we have regulatory oversight of local government to the extent that they have, uh, they're have they subject to environmental laws. The, there was a lot of anxiety in local government that we were going to be, if you excuse the vernacular, a monumental pain in the arse for them. Um, I've had to explain a lot of the time that I'm not very interested in unpicking individual decisions in local government. But I do get a lot of complaints about local government. Uh, and I think over time we may well see patterns that... Um, we see across multiple local authorities of areas where the laws are they're not working very well or where it's persistently not being complied with. If we see those patterns, we may well want to look into one as a test case or do some thematic reviews of that. But yeah, it's, 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 at the moment, um, it hasn't risen to the surface of something that of, of na we try to look at things that are of na national strategic significance and we haven't identified that pattern in local government yet. We might. Okay. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank and before you. we go, we've got a medal. This is very exciting. So they told me I was going to get a medal. medal. Thank you. I'm sure someone wants a photo. I've told everyone at the OEP that we're getting a medal. I have to bring it into the office and we're going to put it on the wall. We're very excited. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Neil. Hi, everyone. Me again, and not for the last time today, I'm afraid to say. Um, so, oh, I'll tell you what, though. I've been told there's a step. <laughs> oh, I'll be at least five foot four now. How about that? <laughs> <Ta -da! laughs> Very exciting. Um, so, yes, yeah, my pleasure to say a little bit about the NBN Awards for Wildlife Recording. The awards were set up in 2015 to recognise and celebrate the phenomenal work of wildlife recorders and those who share data across the UK. And since we launched the awards, um, we have celebrated the work and achievements of 64 biological recorders. The awards were set up in partnership with the Biological Records Centre and the National Forum for Biological Recording. And it's wonderful to be able to continue this tradition of celebrating um, what we see as you know, the unsung heroes within our sector, the people who are out there day in, day out, fine weather and foul, collecting data. So as we have um, celebrated the awards since 2015, we decided it was time for a bit of a review. And one of the reasons for that was that we saw the number of nominations dropping. And despite our best efforts, we weren't having um, very many nominations coming forward at times for certain categories. And so we thought, OK, well, let's have a look at this. Um, let's go back to, back to basics and let's go to our community, to past award winners, to past nominators of award winners and um, uh, nominees and to see what, what you recommend. And there are a number of key findings that you have recommended. Firstly, to change the nomination period. So previously, it was May to July that nominations were open, whereas from uh, 2024, it's going to be January to March. And the feeling there was that we should really be avoiding the ecologist's busy field season when the last thing you want to be doing, you know, when you get back in after a tiring day in the field was filling in some paperwork to nominate someone or yourself, you know, however worthy uh, the cause might be. Um, another change is to review the current NBN award categories. And as a result of that, we are now adding two new categories, one for lifetime achievement and another one for verifiers, which, you know, again, such an important, critical part of our community, um, which, you know, isn't often highlighted or, or celebrated. 
We were asked if we could simplify the nomination process further, which we have responded to, and to publicise the awards more widely. And perhaps that's something that you can help with. Um, we would love it if you would take on this, um, the, the mantle of helping us share and publicise and celebrate the awards, and most importantly, get those nominations in. Because we know, you all know, people, who, uh, people and groups who deserve these awards, and it'd be fantastic if we can renew your enthusiasm for nominating people and making sure that the awards are um, worthwhile and special and sustainable for the long term. Um, so we're going to be meeting some of the past award winners very shortly, but I am told that I can actually point them out on screen, although I can't now see the, um, the clicker. You've got it, so you can do it. So we have um, Callie, who is second from the left in the top row, who was a winner in 2015. We have uh, um, Vary, who is top right, who was a winner in 2017. And we have Dakota... Uh, second row from the bottom, third in from the right, in the sunglasses there, who was a winner in 2021. It's so lovely to reconnect with past winners. I think it's something in the past, you know, we've given out the awards and then we've all gone about, you know, gone on our ways and, and nothing more has happened. But we love to reconnect with our past winners and to find out what they're doing. And that's what's happening next. So um, back to Neil to introduce them. And I shall remove the step since you don't need it, do you? Nice of you to say that. <laughs> <laughs> well, Hands up who thinks I need them. <laughs> it's there if you do. <laughs> well, let, let's just hand straight over to uh, Callie Ullman Smith. Who, uh, what was it? What day was it? 2017. 2015. 2015, yes. Published your first report in the Highland Naturalist in 2012. Uh, yes. Fantastic. Um, and I have my. Hello everyone, I am Callie Ullman Smith and I won the David Robinson MBN Youth Award uh, in 2015 and it is an absolute honour to be asked back to talk about how I got there and what I've done since. Uh, for me it all started when I was seven, um, being forced outside by my mother and <laughs> And, uh, and I started volunteering with the Highland Biological Recorder Group, specifically with amphibians and reptiles, and that really inspired a love for herpetology with me. Um, and then I got to volunteer with the Highland Seashore Project, which was absolutely an amazing project, three-year project that just took me right across the region. Um, and I, I learned so much about our marine environments and how special they are, especially in this country. Um, and then they... Both of these things were collided wonderfully in the work that I would, you know, would dominate my life for the next few years. And that was Kirkton Bay with palmate newts uh, on the coast in saltwater conditions. Uh, there's David O'Brien. He really is a guru. Um, and it was, it was so many years of just wondering why these amphibians were here. They really weren't meant to be. Challenging conditions, uh, it, really, it really was. Sometime, I mean, when you're on the west coast of the Highlands, you know that it's often jeek and grey and wet and cold. And we are right next uh, to Lookout, where sometimes uh, those waves would just be clawing at us, and we're only a couple metres away from them. This is my paper uh, that I got to publish in 2021. Writing it in 2020, it was COVID, there was nothing else to do. Um, so if you like to go read that, please, please do. Uh, these are the results um, from that. And you can see that predominantly most of the pools were pretty much fresh water, but it's, it's this range up into very high saline conditions where it was really interesting because we were finding newts, not just adults, but also larvae in those conditions. Um, and there were you know, a plenty of these pools who, who recorded really high salinities. And we saw, we see there um, this stable population of palmate newts, the fact that it is adults, and then this high number of larvae, and then that you know, naturally drops off, and then we get adults again year after year. 
Now, uh, I am now uh, a volunteer with Amphibian and Reptile Conservation. Uh, this was one project we did, which was really great. We're working with the community and getting them to just fall in love with ponds that they can find in their garden in the backyard. Um, that's fellow volunteer Molly, uh, who you know is amazing. She doesn't just drive the whole team to the location, she does most of the work and then drives us all home again. <laughs> Uh, this is this is me volunteering with Ark when they actually made me wear the purple shirt. I don't look good in purple. This is a rare photo. Uh, <laughs> and then being part now of Edinburgh Uni in my third year, and uh, this is this is the good side of it, being able to go outside and work in some really incredible spots. Uh, this was me helping Molly with her dissertation um, and finding. Find more of the creatures that I just love. Uh, and I am now also treasurer to the, what was formerly uh, Biological Conservation Society uh, of Edinburgh University. We are now the Wildlife Society because the former name was a mouthful. Um, and this was one of our really great events where we managed to just go onto campus grounds and just show how much life uh, there was. And every once in a while, I do get back to where it all started, and uh, I love it. And the MBN award was a really high achievement and a, and a wonderful moment. And it's put me on a, a fantastic path in life. So thank you for listening. And um, yeah, it's been great. <laughs>
that under celebration can be reversed. Um, so thank you so much for having me. Next up, uh, Matt larsen Dorr, CEO of the Mammal Society, with a group of award winners in 2020. Thank you. Bye. Hello, yes, uh, I, we deal with mammals, so I don't have a puffin up there, I've got a shrew. Um, we stand up for the, uh, for the little guy, and shrew's uh, amazing family uh, includes our smallest British mammal, our only venomous British mammal, and the only family of uh, wildlife that shrinks in winter, including its brain. So, uh, yes, we were the 2020 MBN Group Award winners. Um, that was the year that we published our Mammal Atlas of the UK, um, which hopefully uh, you all have at home on your shelves. Um, and since then, we've been very busy. But for those of you that aren't aware of, of the Mammal Society, like the Shrew, we are very small but very important and very busy. Uh, our vision is a future in which sustainable mammal populations thrive as part of healthy and diverse ecosystems benefiting people and nature across the British Isles, and we do that a lot by collecting data, also using data, so we're both a contributor and a user of the MBN um, to inform data-led conservation, um, but we also uh, are very focused on skill building. Uh, we have a training program, we have an education and outreach project, uh, and we also uh, do as much as we can to raise awareness of the issues facing British mammals um, and the need for science-led conservation. Um, you might be aware of our Mammal Mapper tool. I don't need to go into the detail. Um, you heard about the INS Mapper tool earlier from Steph. It's, it's basically the same, uh, but for mammals, um, it's a great one to have in your pocket uh, and just to, wherever you're out and about, for any other kind of survey or just for a walk, um, just have it ready to record uh, your mammal sightings or set yourself going on a transect survey. Um, and this was what fueled uh, the Mammal Atlas, along with other MBN data, um, but we also uh, are con constantly refining and adding to this app to make it as easy as possible uh, for anyone to record mammals and submit those records. Um, and anything we collect through Mammal Mapper is not retained for the Mammal Society. Uh, it is passed through iRecord for verification and into the MBN Atlas. Um, we also have a local groups network. We are currently um, continuing to grow and support our local groups, and we have a very big focus at the moment on trying to diversify uh, those that are involved in our surveys, those that are involved in citizen science for biodiversity monitoring, uh, much needed in our sector. Um, and that includes age, uh, ethnicity, and various other um, demographic counters. Um, we have our National Harvest Mouse Survey launched since we were the winners in 2020. Uh, so 2021 was our first survey. It's been running, it's now in its third year. Really, really important. Everyone can get involved in this. We are in our third survey season right now, not looking for harvest mice themselves, but looking for the nests that they leave behind from the breeding season in the summer. So we do our, our surveying over the winter. Um, so it's non-disruptive, although this year we have seen them using those nests right into October, which is very unusual. And we've got a report uh, of each year, including last year's. Um, we also have, for Scotland, we have a volunteer mountain hare survey, which is a partnership with BTO, Nature Scott, and Game and Wildlife Conservation Trust, using Mapper Mapper to try and improve biological survey data uh, on mountain hare. Um, and right now, a very exciting project. Uh, it's inspired by the need to track um, a non-native potentially invasive uh, new species in Britain that we found last year through our local groups network, the Greater White Two Shrew, um, but also to improve small mammal records um, uh, across the whole of, of the British Isles. Uh, we're doing owl pellet dissection uh, to find out what owls have been finding. Uh, th there we go, that's one that's been unwrapped for you. So that's a, a shrew as well. Uh, actually, no, that's not, <laughs> sorry, that's a vole. Oh, I should have had a shrew. Um, okay, right. <laughs> And then just, uh, uh, I've only got three minutes, so I think I'm up. Uh, so I'm just going to mention, uh, we've got our annual conference. It's every year. Next year is in the spring, uh, 2024. Please do um, uh, attend if you're interested in uh, mammal monitoring, mammal surveying, building your skills, building your knowledge of what else is going on around that in the sector. Um, and if you are a member of the Mammal Society, it's considerably cheaper. I think you get your year's membership basically back on your annual conference ticket, especially if you then also do one of our training programs, which are also thoroughly reduced for members. Um, and do get involved in your local groups and help us to help the MBN to help mammals. Okay, I think that's me done. Thank you very much.
Thank you. Um, I do need the little still, but um, I'll make do anyway. Um, yes, please, actually, I'm very short. <laughs> Thank you. Um, hi, I'm Dakota Reid and I won the Newcomer Award in 2021 and um, I am from Northern Ireland and as you've just heard there are some particular challenges with um, Northern Ireland and saving the environment there um, and one of these actually is the marine environment and the data gaps in the marine environment which I'm going to mention a bit. Um, since I won the award which was absolute, a huge surprise and really really lovely because I got involved in um, biological recording during the first lockdown for the first time. I wasn't from a science background. Um, and in the last two years, I've gone on to do a master's in ecological management, which it certainly helped doing all of that recording and feeling sort of boosted and motivated to keep going with the recording uh, through the recognition from NBN. Um, and then continued volunteering as well. Um, continued doing terrestrial recording. It was um, entomological recording that I really got involved with first. And um, that's really how I ended up sort of here, um, but, um, and that included on RSPB reserves, and I work for the RSPB, um, and including getting a new moth record um, for Northern Ireland, a new moth species, Silky Wainscot. Usually when I tell people that, they look a little bit um, confused about why that's exciting, but I'm speaking to the right crowd today, I think. Um, but um, something I wanted to talk about particularly was sort of getting into this marine space. Um, so just over a year ago, I helped um, assist with founding this group called Wild Belfast and um, over the last year I've run um, I think it's maybe half a dozen of these marine recording sessions and I think it's just sort of being passionate about not coming from a sciencey background and wanting to sort of um, you know help the nature crisis and wanting to sort of create a space for people who um, wanted to do the same, wanted to find out what's on their doorstep and wanted to do something about saving that um, and recording it. So these sessions have been really, really good um, and I've certainly felt motivated to run them from um, winning the award. It really gave me a bit of confidence to do something like that. Basically, we're using iNaturalist and encouraging people to come down to Belfast Lock, my patch um, that I've explored over the years and was just amazed to find out how much was there and thought, I really want to share this with other people. Um, we've had, I think, over the last sort of six months that we've been running this, um, I think we've maybe had about 60 odd people in total have attended them, um, which has been absolutely fantastic. Loads of people doing this for the first time, getting them to log those records and find some interesting wildlife. Um, you know, we found some really cool things, you know, things like starfish are always a crowd pleaser, um, but also something like snake locks and enemies, which I, having visited the, the area for years, didn't even realize was on our particular piece of shoreline, didn't expect to find it there. Um, but a particular thing I wanted to talk about was the native oyster. Um, which some of, if, if you know a bit about um, Northern Ireland or I think the situation is probably quite similar in Scotland, um, you know, underwent huge declines but starting to make a bounce back in part due to um, conservation efforts. So in Belfast Lock, the species went extinct. It was partly because of exploitation, um, but also because of the very, very poor water quality in the lock. And it was because people were just sort of out and about and recording them that we realised they're actually naturally making a bit of a bounce back. And then um, our partners, um, Ulster Wildlife, um, are doing a sort of reintroduction scheme there. So something like this, which we found during these surveys, um, has been you know, a real example of why citizen science matters, why getting out to your local area and finding out what's there really matters. Um, but definitely winning the award did give me some of the confidence to do that. In my day-to-day -day job now in, um, in policy and RSPB, um, I use data from the other end a lot and see why it really, really matters, um, which I think is meant in my free time really trying to get encourage people and encourage people from different backgrounds and you know Belfast is an increasingly diverse and wonderful city um, and getting those people out and about exploring Belfast Lock is something we're quite disconnected from often in the city and getting people to realize there's so much just on our doorsteps it's really fantastic um, and it's been great and thanks for thank you to the N NBN Trust for you know probably giving me a lot of the confidence to do that um, because it's been fantastic watching people have their eyes open to the amazing wildlife we have on our shores and hopefully motivating them to save it a wee bit. Thank you. Um, although we've um, paused the NBN Awards until next year, we're still going to present the John Sawyer NBN Open Data Award as this recognises and celebrates outstanding contribution of NBN data partners towards achieving NBN's mission of making data work for nature. 
so I'd like to announce the award um, to the winner of the Open Data Award 2023 is the National Longhorn Beetle Recording Scheme. Um, in, and I'd like to invite Simon Rolfe of the UK Centre for Ecology and Hydrology to accept the award on behalf of Will Heaney. Please. Well, I've, I've just got a, should I say, yeah, a bit? You, you, you okay, um, so yeah, I, I'm here representing the Biological Record Centre, who enables and supports these recording schemes. It really is the award goes to the recording schemes. Um, so the, uh, record, uh, the National Longhorn Beetle Recording Scheme has uh, over 41,000 verified records, two data sets on the MBN Atlas contributes uh, over two-thirds of all the Longhorn Beetle records on, on the MBN Atlas. Uh, it covers about uh, 60 species, mostly large charismatic um, species, uh, but many have larvae which uh, develop in decaying wood and uh, are therefore very important indicators of ancient woodland. The scheme was set up uh, with the Biological Records Centre in, in partnership in 1982. Uh, and then in 1999, there was a, uh, a national atlas uh, published by the then scheme organiser, uh, Dr. Peter Twin. It was subsequently led by Dr. Martin Redzik and Peter Hodge. Then in 2016, Will Heaney, um, uh, who is the uh, receiver, recipient of the reward, who couldn't be here, unfortunately, uh, but also alongside Katie Potts, took on the scheme. They enthusiastically uh, encourage people to get out and, and record, very active on social media and um, articles and running workshops. And, and they published uh, a field studies council guide to get more people out and about. Uh, so yeah, this has led to a, a lot more records in recent years. Uh, records are uh, typically submitted to the scheme via iRecord or, or on spreadsheets. Uh, and then all verified records end up on the MBN Atlas under an open license, which is great. Um, updated every month. Uh, Katie Potts steps down from the scheme a few years ago uh, due to other commitments, but Will Heaney has been carrying on uh, good work. Unfortunately, uh, Will um, can't uh, at attend this, and uh, so, so Martin Harvey was going to accept it, but unfortunately he can't make it either. Uh, so uh, you've stuck with me. Um, but uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll pass on this uh, reward to him, and uh, I think it's very well deserving, very active scheme. And if you see a longhorn beetle out there, then do record it, submit it to iRecord, and it will be on the MBN Atlas uh, before you know it. Uh, so um, yeah, thank you very much. This laptop's doing different things. Oh, go back one. Yeah. Yay. Yeah. Right. Hi. For those who haven't met me yet, my name's Giselle, and I'm the lead for iNaturalist UK. Um, it's great that a number of um, our talkers today have already talked about iNaturalist, and um, what I'm going to do is hopefully give you an overview of the use and impact of iNaturalist in the UK and, and its place in, in system science. See if I can get this zapper to work. Yes. Yeah. So for those who don't know, iNaturalist UK is part of a global wildlife recording platform. And the MBN Trust are the lead um, organisation, and we're supported by the Biological Record Centre and also the Marine Biological Association. Many of you will have come across the app, and that's very widely used globally and also in the UK. But we do encourage people in the UK to actually go onto the iNaturalist UK website to explore to identify and learn much more about the observations because there's a lot more going on on that. 
So iNaturalist UK was, um, was launched in April 2021. And since that date, we've um, had around 46,000 people have affiliated to iNaturalist UK, which means they've been active since that date um, in April 2021. We've also had over 3 million verifiable observations being added, added to the site. And as you can see, UK users are part of a global community, which includes 20 partner networks. And this means that all these partner networks, including myself, we all sit on the international steering group. So we kind of have an have a input into what's going on with the development on a global basis. So what happens to all these records? Well, many of you may have seen this data flow diagram before or something similar. So in the UK, um, there are a number of ways that data flows into the MBN Atlas. iNaturalist UK data is downloaded by the Biological Records Centre and to iRecord, where the research-grade observations are available for verifiers to assess. And they'll be as, so they can assess them in the same way they assess any other observations that are added directly to iRecord or come from any other routes. We also had a talk about GBIF. So global data is shared by iNaturalist um, globally to, to GBIF. And this is the um, information relating to the UK data. Um, as you can see from the graph on the right, um, recording on iNaturalist has definitely increased since um, 2018, which is around the time of the launch of the original app. And from 2021 onwards was when iNaturalist UK went live. Um, and there's a link to, to these, these stats from the iNaturalist UK hub pages on the MBN Trust website. And then on the other side is something we've alluded to before in, in talks, is about um, the observations by licence type. We know that there's a lot more we need to do to educate users to change their licence settings to either CCBY or CC0, as these licence types ensure that observations can be used as widely and shared as much as possible. So if you are on iNaturalist, there is a call out, please go and check your license settings and ensure you make them as open as possible so they can be used by your local environmental record centres and national schemes and societies for onward education and research. So who uses NineNaturalist? Who are the people who, who are, are recording their sightings? Well, this snapshot gives you an idea of the sort of people. So for example, it might be individuals who like the travel, who like grassroots football, macro photography, as well as organisations such as local environmental record centres, all got a passion to record and share wildlife data. And this graph shows, um, illustrates a global trend when people sign up to iNaturalist. Now, I'm not going to give any prizes for you to spot when the City Nature Challenge might be taking place. <laughs> and also there's a, a slight increase around the time of the Euro Bureau bits as well. And perhaps this graph can demonstrate that actually if we create the right citizen science project, um, we can engage more and new people in recording. So one way that we can is um, that iNaturalist UK engages people and also groups can engage with its users as via the project's feature. It's basically a filtering tool. So it's used by international projects such as the City Nature Challenge and the Eurobioblitz. But also, in the UK, you've got our National Parks UK Look Wild, so that includes sightings that come from the Cairngorm National Park, for example. And those who, who were here last year will remember why are speaking about spotting wildlife, um, recording wildlife spotted on their, their zoo sites. It's also used by other organisations, so the Diptus Forum are a big user of it. And part of their reason for being on there is to help educate and inform about learning to ID these particular species. Um, then you also find small specialist projects, so, for example, COVID, Corvids of Aberdeen on there, but also as an education, education, sorry, Edinburgh Living City project. So you're in Edinburgh, if you get the time, go out and record on an iNitrous and add to that project and add to the sightings found across the city. So what have these users discovered? Yes, there are many observations of the easy spots, but there are also some gems in this treasure trove. For example, located on a busy road, I used to walk past this tree every day on my way to work when we were still at the office. This year, it's home to Corn Gromwell. This plant is on the GB red list and was quite happily growing alongside the busy main road on a site probably regularly overlooked for plant surveys, but spotted by 
an enthusiastic iNaturalist user, not myself and my dad, but, you know, just someone who, who picked up iNaturalist and just keen to record and, and looking on those pavements and, and cracks in between. So this, this sample is only four observations on iNaturalist and in, on the NBN Atlas only 211 have been recorded since 2020. These three examples show how unstructured, random recording by natural users can also yield interesting results. For example, the watermelon. Who would have thought that an urban scrubland behind swimwear manufacturer Speedos HQ would be a potential site for Nottingham's first wild watermelon farm? <laughs> False London rocket. OK, this example is growing outside Nottingham's ice arena. It is common in the industrial areas of this city and also, no doubt, elsewhere. But the Nottingham variant is actually unusual because it's totally hairless. In June this year, I was contacted by two prominent nature photographers asking for the best place to take photos for their new book. So you're going to look out for a photo of their Nottingham uh, false London rocket located near the tip um, by a tired cash and carry with a shopping trolley in the background. It was the best glamorous location I could find for them. <laughs> Also, the European orchard bee. Now, this is a good example of the iNaturalist community at work, I think. In 2020, Hannah, a casual iNaturalist user, took part in the City Nature Challenge while stuck at home, like the rest of us. And by chance, the bee decided to land on her bedroom, bathroom window and lay down and die, sadly. But she took a photo. She used the iNaturalist, iNaturalist ID tool and shared the record of the European orchard bee. But actually, was it? If correct, it would be a first for the area. And it generated a lot of interest on and off iNaturalist. naturalist. I emailed her and said, you know, has she still got the bee? Unfortunately, no, she chucked it out the window. Never mind. OK. In April this year, three years later, got an excited email from her. I found another one, and I've kept the specimen. We were able to ask Trevor Pendleton, who some of you may know from Meekering Birds, to identify it. This allowed us to assume that the original sighting was correct and therefore a new local record. So we know that iNaturalist has been embraced in the UK by a wide variety of people and organisations, all infused to record and share what their wildlife sightings. However, we don't actually really know much about them or have done an in-depth analysis of their data. So for future plans, We'll be working with Exeter University as part of their renewed project to carry out an in-depth analysis of the data and also the users. So if you're an iNaturalist user, please look out for that, and if you do get um, a survey, please respond. Um, we've been developing a strategy to try and leverage more funding to allow us to tell those data stories and also educate users um, to help improve the records and also the data flow. We'll continue to work with yourselves as well, with the recording community widely, to improve data flow and the quality of the records. And finally, iNaturalist UK, we're excited that we're going to be part of the Education Nature Park suite of tools, and we're learning a bit more about that following this talk. So thank you very much. And This session, session three, we have Lucy Robinson, Citizen Science Manager from Natural History Museum. Thank you. Oh, that's not my first line. Ah. Do I need this stand? I'm going for it. <laughs> Hi, thanks for inviting me to speak today. I'm really proud to be introducing a new project that builds on the long-term partnership that the Natural History Museum has had with the NBN Trust. Uh, and I'm particularly excited about this new project because it combines citizen science or community science, as we now call it, the Natural History Museum, with actually taking action to improve the situation for nature and actually work towards nature recovery. And that's a real shift for us in our community science program uh, to move on from studying nature to really pairing that with action. So I'm Lucy Robinson, I'm Deputy Head of the Centre for UK Nature at the Museum and I also lead our Community Science Programme. There's quite a few members of our team here, so please go and see our stand in the coffee break. 
We cover quite a range of different areas related to UK nature. And this particular project today really weaves together the community science, the UK nature recovery and that skills development piece. So the new programme is called the National Education Nature Park. It's an England-wide partnership funded by uh, the government's Department for Education. And I'm speaking on behalf of a big partnership here. The RHS uh, are our other big delivery partner, and our Northeast Regional team are here. And there's a whole range of other partners who are supporting this program alongside a wider pool of stakeholders uh, that includes many of the organizations in this room. So why is the Department for Education funding biological recording or nature recovery? So they have had a realization that they have influence over a great deal of land. All of the land that schools, nurseries, and colleges are on in this country really adds up. And we also know that as well as uh, improving green space is good for nature, it's good for young people, and it develops those skills towards these skill sets uh, in STEM that we know is a future skills need. So the Department for Education has funded us for five years, um, but they very much see this as a long-term program that will exist beyond that point. And the overall aim of the program really is in line with also the museum's mission to create advocates for the planet. It's about people connecting with nature, learning about nature, and then developing the sense of agency that they can take action. So our overall program goals, um, the kind of First and foremost one is to achieve biodiversity gain across the educational estate. And that greening and enhancing biodiversity uh, obviously is good for our environment, but we know that it's good for young people's well-being and mental health. So they spend a lot of their time in school. So making schools greener, more biodiverse spaces is good for our young people too. We have only launched last month, so it's very early days. So this is very much an introductory talk and many details of this program are not yet finalized but we've been really pleased with the response so far and more than a thousand settings have now signed up um, to take part and there's a nice geographic spread across England there so we've been pleased with the early uptake. So what does the program look like if you're a teacher uh, or a young person? We have this five-step uh, cycle so first, they explore their site, they get to know their site, um, get comfortable with spending time outdoors, learning in nature, uh, doing that year round, not just in the summer, and understanding what does their site currently offer for nature and for themselves. And then they'll work through a process of identifying opportunities to enhance their site, bringing in lots of different parts of the curriculum with creativity, citizenship, maths, geography, um, collective decision making and then actually making those changes on their site and monitoring uh, the impacts of their actions and then continuing in this uh, cycle um, of then thinking what's the next improvement that we could make. So on our website we have a range of resources and activities um, that teachers can filter and choose from there's essentially a spine of community science that runs through the program of gathering data, uh, using those data to make informed evidence-driven decisions and enhancing your site. And wrapped around that is a whole suite of engagement activities that speak to these different parts of the curriculum uh, and bring in lots of fun and creativity that wrap around this program um, as young people work through it. So focusing a little bit on the data side of this, uh, the first task that we're asking uh, settings to do is to outline their site, so to define this is our space that we're going to work on. And then they'll be mapping their existing habitats. Next week we're releasing our habitat mapping resources. So they're going to get an understanding of what is their baseline, what's their starting point from which to measure any change or any gains. They'll then be studying what's living on their site and then planning and implementing those interventions and monitoring, as I say. So this habitat mapping has been adapted from UK HABs and the urban greening factor. Um, they can create maps like this. There's a, Esri is our partner on this program and they're developing mapping tools um, to help schools map their sites. 
and we've developed a suite of resources then that support that. So there are activities that support young people to understand core concepts that they need to know, is a tree deciduous or evergreen, um, about percentage coverage of different plants, etc. and then a series of habitat identification resources that support them uh, to know what habitat they've got, and then they will use a digital tool to map it. Once the habitat stuff is launched, we'll be moving on to uh, planning our biodiversity surveys. So from the spring, um, schools will be starting to gather biodiversity data. Some of this will be habitat-specific surveys. Uh, some will be more uh, broader biological recording using iNaturalist. Um, and we'll be developing also some habitat condition assessment. So as well as recording species, they can record in changes to management techniques that they make on their site. I'll skip over that one because I'm conscious I'm short on time. So in terms of data flow, I think we're very much at this coal phase of this catastrophic success of many, many young people uh, recording data. The purpose of this program is that every young person in this country does citizen science, does biological recording as part of their education. So the data will be held by ESRI, and we're very conscious that we don't want to overwhelm and flood existing systems beyond their capacity. So we will be kind of curating where data flow on and making sure that only the good quality or data that um, national schemes and societies have capacity to receive flows through. But it's important to say that all of the data are CC0 licensed, so they will all be publicly available and open for use, and we'll be managing that process of where they flow onto um, so that we don't overwhelm existing systems. So our core uh, objective is to measure biodiversity gain or to achieve a, an increase in biodiversity on the educational estate. So how are we actually going to measure that? Um, we have a couple of postdoctoral researchers within the programme, one of which is Victoria Burton, sitting in the middle. Wave, Victoria. <laughs> so in the next few months, Victoria will be uh, working with the wider team to develop a research plan of how can we evidence these changes. Some of these uh, are quite measurable, and we can, we can quantify that. But others, right, you plant a tree, you don't suddenly see a massive increase in biodiversity. These are longer-term gains. So we'll also be using data modelling techniques to predict those longer-term uh, likely gains that can't be measured within the time frame of our programme. So I invite you all to join us, and by that I mean with your biodiversity hats on, many of your organisations are potential partners and stakeholders for us. Um, please be patient with us because we have many, many stakeholders across biodiversity and education and sustainability sectors, but we really do want to work across the sector. <coughs> but also, taking off your biodiversity hats, many people in this room will be parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles, governors of your local school. Please encourage uh, the schools that you know or your local schools to participate um, in this programme. It's for every nursery, school or college in England. So uh, we certainly have a very, very wide remit to cover. So I'll close there. Thank you very much for your time. And uh, I hope to come back with more data-driven um, updates at future conferences. This is the introduction early days. And I hope we'll be sharing lots of successes of Nature Gains um, in future years. So thanks very much.